we get stuck at denunciation. And because I've worked with folks who have killed other human beings, what was that about? Or why did you join a gang? The truth is no hopeful kid has ever joined a gang in the history of the world. And no kid is seeking anything when he joins a gang. He's always fleeing something. As a society, we start to look at what is that kid fleeing? And how can we bring a sense of healing and repair? You can't calm yourself down if you've never been soothed. I was born and raised in Los Angeles. I've never had to carry anything that these men and women have had to carry. Just horrific things. Very little of it was of their own choosing. It chose them. I really do stand in awe. And I look at their pain and their wound. I know that I would never have survived a single day of any of their childhoods. Hello, my friends. At Intersections, we are always striving to cut through and connect the dots and dissolve boundaries and feel very much one with everything in nature and in life. And today, we have a unique opportunity to extend that frame into the very, if you want to call it, the margins of society. The folks who at times get just lost from our sight, the uh, the powerless, you know, the voiceless, you know, as uh, our next guest will will call them. And the um, person I'm referring to who is going to be with us is Father Gregory Boyle. He is a Jesuit priest and the founder of Homeboy Industries. This is the largest and most successful gang rehabilitation and reentry program in the world. It's offered as an exit ramp, you know, for those who are struck in a cycle of violence and incarceration. For this service to humanity, Father Boyle has received the California Peace Prize and has been inducted into the California Hall of Fame. In 2014, President Obama named Father Boyle as a champion of change. He is the author of several books, including Barking to the Choir, The Power of Radical Kinship, and the New York Times bestseller, which is an amazing book. You know, all his writings are, this is the one I can personally testify to as well, Tattoos on the Heart, The Power of Boundless Compassion. Father Boyle, welcome. It's good to be with you. Uh, thank you. I have um, been a long-standing admirer of your work ever since some very, very dear friends of ours from uh, Los Angeles have given me you know, a copy of your, of your book, um, you know, Tattoos on the Heart, and, um, you know, having um, just absorbed the stories and the, and the spirit of what uh, you communicate there it was a really such an uplifting experience. There is such a lot of richness in the things that I'd want to invite you to kind of, you know, help share with us in this very rich and story journey. But maybe, maybe Father, we can start with... Um, you know, your, your draw towards the Jesuits. You describe the Jesuit community as, as hilarious, as joyful, as prophetic. Can you talk a little bit more about, yeah, you know, the, um, the qualities they exude and, and sort of what got you initially attuned to that and drawn to that world? Well, I was uh, taught by the Jesuits. I actually had an uncle who was a Jesuit, but I didn't really get to know him until I became one. I think in the early days, I would say hilarious and prophetic. And part of that was they were just so fun to be with. And this was during the days of the Vietnam War, so they were kind of on the front lines of protest, which appealed to me. You know, later on, you know, you the authenticity of one's life is kind of measured by joy and fearlessness, which is, you know, a fuller expression of prophetic and hilarious. So... Yeah, joy and fearlessness is really kind of the, the mark and measure. So that's what drew me there, because I found that, you know, undeniably attractive. And, you know, so I wanted to uh, all have what they're having. And so I that was kind of the the whole reason. And then, you know, as things deepen, I've been a Jesuit for 51 years. You kind of deepen your sense of, what our charism is and what, what are the things that Jesuits believe and how, how, what aligns us with each other. And so, you know, it's, it's always been a, 
a sense of aligning the compass of my heart, really, to that kind of way of being, the way of proceeding that appeals to me still to this day. You mentioned joy and fearlessness are, you know, the foundations of authenticity. I, I find that fascinating in part because um, I also like to challenge what I see sometimes as kind of like the mainstream view on authenticity. We are living at a time when everyone is seeking that thing or wanting to be, you know, true to themselves and be themselves. And and yet sometimes I find it to be understood in a more sort of limiting light of just... Um, expressing whatever thought and feeling is coming to you and being sort of like vulnerable in a way that may, you know, make you just want to voice a fear or, yeah. So, whereas what you're referring to is something, it seems to me, deeper, something that lies at the core of a being that, you know, may or may not be immediately visible at times, but if we keep, perhaps, I don't know, striving for it, we we get to see our true self in, in that more more deeper, authentic light. Can you talk a little bit about that? I think that the whole goal is to try to find your true self in loving. And and so then you end up loving being loving. It's it's kind of where the joy is. And and so you kind of land on that, which is, is not, you know, the ground of your being, which is it's really more um, oceanic than it is actually land. Then you you get to a place where you're you're kind of floating, this sense of love, you know, and and I think Rumi used to say love is God's religion, and so so you find yourself there. That's when you discover that's where the joy is, and so once you you know, land in this place of of joy and you're grounded in that, then then you can kind of be an anchor for other people, because you're grounded. And you're kind of, you know, your true self in, in the loving. So, you know, the Tibetans have an expression about, you know, wherever you have felt the most love, that's your home. But the problem with that thinking is, is then you, you leave that place. And then, then you lament that you're not there because that's home. But I think the real trick in finding joy and fearlessness is discovering that loving is your home. And once you know that, then you're never homesick. And and it's never about return on your, you know, investment. It's never about uh will will people love me back? You know, whether they do or not, that that doesn't impact your joy. You're loving being loving and love never fails. And the road to love never ends. So that's where you want to be. And, you know, you, you learn this over a lifetime, and and we all wish we had learned it earlier, but then it's freeing, you know, you're not waiting, you're not waiting for people to, to send affectionate love in your direction, because uh, loving is enough. You talk about floating in it, you talk about the base being an ocean, not, not just a ground, uh, that being the true home, you don't need it coming to you from others as much as you're just flowing with it yourself. Yeah, how how powerful. It suggests a certain capacity for any or all of us to just have this unconditional, universal, just, um, yeah, infinite, <laughs> infinite love. And I want to unpack that more, but also in practical terms and how it kind of shows up in our ways of being in the world. This, this capacity to love in this way that you've just described. One of the things that I have pondered on is to what extent does there need to be a precondition to that, which is that we have to feel almost sort of like infinitely loved? And I don't necessarily mean in, um, in a romantic or in a human form, but loved by the universe, loved by the spirit, loved by God, loved by some entities out there. And, and then our cup is full and then we can just keep offering it you know, to the world at large as well. You know, is that an important part of like the... Jesuit practice and path, you know, this this um, awareness and attunement to how much love is flowing to you from the universe. I don't know how how much of it is particularly Jesuit. Like today, you know, it's uh, noon here, and we, you know, we start at nine o'clock in the morning, basically. And I've had four moments where I've had big, huge old gang members with covered in tattoos, just sobbing in my office. Part of the thing is that they were feeling so much shame 
you know, they had kind of colored outside the lines. One guy had gotten in a fight. Another guy had relapsed. Another guy just kind of disappeared on us. Anyway, so, and I found myself saying the same thing to all four of them. I said, do you think there's any way that I would ever cut you loose? Is there any way that I will change my opinion about you? And they're just sobbing. I go, no. You know, I, I love you with a no matter whatness, so it doesn't matter what's happened or what you have done. You're part of my, I said, you're you're my sangre, you're my blood. I'm, we're connected forever. And so there's no room for shame. Shame doesn't make any sense, you know, because I, I'll never think less of you. You know, so I... It was odd that I had four of those this morning where they were all kind of coming from different places and they were reacting to different kind of violent outbursts or or moments where they just felt the most profound sense of shame and disgrace. And you want to say there's no need for that. Let's together, let's pick each other up, let's dust each other off, let's put one more foot in front of the next. But that's all we can do. But but none of this alters a relationship. I always talk about a no matter whatness. That it's yeah, it's unconditional. It's inconceivable that there could ever be anything that would rupture this. And and that's that's a total commitment. But it's also, you know, unshakably true. It's just not gonna happen. But we spend so much time fretting and worrying and and really being highly anxious about severed belonging. Spent this entire morning trying to convince people. And I think they left convinced, frankly, that the vulnerability and the tears and the embrace was an opportunity to kind of reclaim something that that is reliable, utterly reliable. You speak about... um returning people to themselves and in that process you're you're returned to yourself yeah i mean i think part of the thing that you know going to the margins is not to reach people or to save or fix people certainly but you go there because that's where the joy is but it's also it's how we inhabit our own nobility and our own dignity is with each other so i'm not transforming anybody's life i've never done it but I know that transformation happens here, and it happens in that kind of nexus, you know, of exquisitely mutual connection, where we're both returning each other to ourselves. Father, so that people who are listening to us can more fully grasp the significance of um, the lived experiences you're talking about, let's go back a little bit in your life journey and can you talk a little bit about sort of like the inception point of this work that um, you have been doing with rehabilitating former gang members, the, um, you know, the emergence of homeboy industries? Yeah, well, so I was ordained in 1984 as a priest. And my first assignment, really, after some further study and a, and a year in Bolivia, was pastor at Dolores Mission, which... It was in Boyle Heights in Los Angeles, nestled in the middle of two public housing projects that were really poor, and it was the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi, and we had eight gangs at war with each other. Los Angeles Police Department called my parish the place of the highest concentration of gang activity in the whole city. So I buried my first young person killed because of this sadness in 1988. And two months ago, I buried my uh, 261st. Not all from that community, but, you know, I run a large gang intervention program. So I get asked to do this. Just was one of those things, you know, I didn't, I never set out to do anything. But I was responding as a pastor to what, the people in my parish were suffering. And it was just extraordinary. 88 to 98 was just the decade of death. It was people were shooting. There were shootings all the time, morning, noon, and night. 
you know, we just started to respond. We started a school. We started a jobs program. Then we, we couldn't find enough employers willing to hire folks. So we started uh, kind of our own businesses, basically. And now, you know, 35 years later, we're the largest gang intervention rehab and reentry program on the planet. But I never set out to do that. We just kind of evolved and backed our way into doing that. So 10,000 folks a year walk through our doors wanting to reimagine their lives. And, and all of them are barricaded behind a wall of shame and disgrace, which is kind of the principal suffering of the poor. And the only thing that can scale that wall is, is tenderness. So we want to stay dedicated to tenderness. And for my money, it's the only thing that really, you know, heals where you can really receive people and allow your heart to be altered by them. So we're, we're kind of the opposite of the Department of Motor Vehicles. You know, it's not come in and, and go to window five if you have anger issues. No, come to the community, you know, where you are safe, seen, and then cherished. And, and that's transformative. But it's, it happens in a culture, in a, in a place, in a community. And everybody is involved in the dosing of affection and tenderness. I um, have the highest regard for what you're doing and um, a great sense of awe as well as to the um, kind of vision and an indomitable sort of uh, just sense of uh, hope and expectation of what sweetness of spirit lies, you know, within everyone, <laughs> regardless of how the appearance might be on the outside. And I want to I wanna help those in our audience who might perhaps be having a more skeptical view as to how much can this approach really help in certain conditions in the darker kind of regions of the world? So today, as we know, you know, we have besotten with a um, wave of an attack on Israel, terrorism, and then a counterattack from them in, in Gaza. And, and there's, there's a lot of tension and stress, you know, in the world coming out from what are acts of violence, you know. And here you are talking about working with, with those who sometimes society, you know, just tends to reject or marginalize or just kind of put aside and, and saying like, no, 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 they have the purest of hearts. They have a childlike beauty inside them and we just need to kind of find a way to nurture it. How would you encourage and open up those who have taken a more us versus them view of how to practically survive and live in the world by kind of figuring out who's, who's good and who's bad or who's, who's on your side and who's, who's the enemy and and they just find it very important to protect themselves from the enemy and to, you know, kind of minimize the damage the enemy can do and all of that, right? So there's that mindset. And then there's kind of the path that you've taken. What counsel would you have, you know, for for those those people who are um, still a little bit more grappling with, you know, but I've got this risk, I've got this danger, I've got this community that I love and I want to protect. And yeah, so. I was at a on a panel in a big auditorium with a rabbi and a, and a columnist from the LA Times and myself. And I can't remember why it came up, but I, I, I said there are two controlling principles at Homeboy that we really embrace. One is every single human being is unshakably good and there are no exceptions. And we belong to each other and there are no exceptions. And then I kind of asked, now do I think all our complex social vexing dilemma would disappear if we embrace those two principles. And I said, yes, I do. And the entire auditorium burst into laughter, and it kind of startled me. And when the laughter subsided, I looked out at them and I said, yes, I do. And yes, I do. I think that, that, that demonizing strikes the high moral distance. And that's always untrue. Demonizing is always untruth. So the minute we've taken sides, and the minute we think there is a them, here one of the mottos is no us and them, just us. And it, which is, begins principally because this is filled with 500 human beings who have to work alongside people they used to shoot at. So everybody had enemies, 
whatever that means. And uh, it's not even about loving enemies in the end. It's about not having any, which is really different. It's the difference between mercy and forgiveness. Why settle for forgiveness when you can have mercy, which is really more fulsome? So anyway, I really do believe that. I, I think every kind of dilemma that faces us, can you can draw a straight line between the fact that we don't believe those things. We don't believe that we belong to each other. We don't believe that everybody's unshakably good. And until we do, it's going to be hard to make progress because that's, that's the starting point. And that really works here. But then you start to go, yeah, but that guy just did a very bad thing. And you go, well, the homies here always say, find the thorn underneath, and which is a way of kind of moving to a place of understanding that really has depth. And then suddenly everybody is standing in awe at what folks have to carry rather than in judgment at how they carry it. I think that's, I'm kind of writing a book right now that I'm calling Cherished belonging, love in divided times. And it's kind of a way to address what is certainly in this country, what we're going through in terms of division and, and the great gulf and distance that separates us. And how do we get to a place where we can actually make progress? You talk about with, with the homies, there's this view about find the thorn. What would be an example of that or where finding of the thorn has led to, you know, kind of a breakthrough in the dynamics between people? Well, because, you know, people are trying to figure out, we get stuck at denunciation, you know, and, and because I've worked with folks who have killed other human beings, you kind of, you know, what was that about? Or why did you join a gang? You know, the truth is no hopeful kid has ever joined a gang in the history of the world. And no kid is seeking anything when he joins a gang. He's always fleeing something. As a society, we, we start to look at what is that kid fleeing? And how can we bring a sense of healing and repair? So, you know, every gang member who walks through the door uh, comes with what psychologists would call a disorganized attachment. You know, mom was either frightened or frightening. And you can't calm yourself down if you've never been soothed. You understand that. I mean, I, I, I'm 70 years old. I, I was born and raised in Los Angeles. I've never had to carry anything that these men and women have had to carry. Just horrific things. And, you know, very little of it was of their own choosing. It chose them. And so, again, I, I really do stand in awe. And I look at their pain and their wound, you know, and their stories are so filled with such heartache. Again, if their stories had been flames, you know, you'd have to keep your distance. Otherwise, you would get scorched. And I know that I would never have survived a single day of any of their childhoods. I've been thinking lately, you know, that Judgment is kind of where we always go. That's our default setting. And what judgment is always trying to get in the room. But what keeps it in the hallway is is curiosity. Because curiosity and judgment can't really coexist. You really do have to choose. Are you going to be curious? Are you going to be judgmental? And so the homies have taught me how to be curious. There was that fight that just happened. and. What was that about? What language was that violence speaking? And then suddenly you're curious about it. You're asking questions. As long as you stay curious, you can find the thorn underneath. As long as you stay curious, then judgment stays out in the hallway and it and actually never gets into the room as long as you can stay curious. And curiosity is basically asking the question and then asking the next question. And it's not like you piece it all together and then finally you understand something. But you're constantly being curious. And it really keeps you from judgment, you know, and then and it requires something of you, which is you have to welcome your own wound. Otherwise you're you're tempted to despise the wounded. 
and the despising of the wounded is is kind of the result of our denunciation and our demonizing and our dehumanizing and otherizing you know these are all things you want to you know steer clear of because it's these are the things that really keep us from each other how odd that our quest for morality it's always kept us from each other and and it's never brought us to a sense of morality it's just brought us to division and how odd that is you know because we think it's a quest I, that's why i would favor it just abandon the quest the moral quest because it's never kept us moral it's only kept us from each other and i think that's sort of important because it's it's about naming things better. So if I unpack that a little bit, uh, Father, I think you're talking here about sort of the moral play as in moral judgment in in sort of claiming some high ground and, and assessing and judging kind of the world through a certain moral lens and then getting unhappy with those who don't sort of meet you know meet that bar or something. Is that is that what you mean by abandoning abandoning the moral pursuit? I think so. I mean it, it's like you know, it's like when we talk of morality or he's a moral person or a decent person or or she has real character. What are you really describing? Are you de describing about some kind of moral achievement? What you're really describing is you're, you're describing somebody who's healthy, who's nearly and relatively whole. You're describing somebody who's well. You're describing somebody who has, I'm sure, excavated their wounds and have, you know, surrendered to their own healing. That's what you're describing. You're not describing a good person. You're you're just you're describing somebody who's well. Why don't you put it in terms like that? Because, you know, you and I our task is not to become good people. Because if there's the baseline which says everybody is unshakably good, that's where you begin. And then you don't kind of, you know, become bad. There are moments of blindness where you get stuck, where you can't see things, but you don't become like homies always come in here and they just help me become a better man. I said, no, you couldn't be even one bit better. The problem is, is that you don't know the truth of who you are. But if, if you're a stranger to yourself, you won't know your own goodness. But the minute you kind of allow yourself to inhabit the truth of who you are, and here at Homeboy, we're allergic to um, holding the bar up and asking folks to measure up. We we hold the mirror up and we say, here's here's who you are. Oh, my God, how did I get so lucky to know you? And you feel that genuinely. It's, it never feels to me like pretend. It never feels like that. But we tend to kind of like, like I'm a Jesuit. And every once in a while, somebody... Jesuits will say, "Oh, you know that guy, he's a good Jesuit." And I it always winces. I always wince because I think there cannot be such a thing as a good Jesuit unless there's such a thing as a bad Jesuit. And there is no such thing. I mean, there's there're wounded people, there are broken people, there are people who are in extraordinary pain, Jesuits but I've never met a bad one. But but because it's so unsophisticated, it's a place where we get stuck. And when we designate people as good or bad, it's just kind of its end of discussion. You know, you no longer can be curious because you've already arrived at who's good and who's bad. And and it, I think it's precisely what what keeps us from making progress is the starting point of the journey that magically you know people are able to take in uh getting to reconnect rediscover the goodness inside them if they've drifted you know into a life that is you know behaviorally you know kind of far from that true nature of theirs is the starting point of that a certain hunger motivation interest commitment from their side to want to sort of open up to your counsel or or have you you know have you encountered people in situations where there was no real interest or engagement and yet somehow having some exposure to the community you know and to you just 
got them to melt a little bit, you know, in the warmth of that love. Yeah, that's an excellent point. You know, part of the thing is our program doesn't exist for those who need it. It's only for those who want it. And so you have to walk through the door. That's that's the only thing we we ask of people. And so people will, over the 35 years of our existence, they'll say, yeah. you know, how do you get gang members to show up there? And we'll go, I don't know. But we don't recruit them and we don't cajole them and we don't try to convince. We don't go to street corners and say, come to Homeboy. Now we serve the whole county of Los Angeles. And there are 120,000 gang members, 1,100 gangs. And my guess is there isn't a single gang member in Los Angeles who doesn't know who we are or where we are or what we do. But you have to walk through the door. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So that's kind of like most rehabs, drug and alcohol, for example. And we're no different. I mean, you, you just you have to walk through the door. But we're kind of like an AA group. Like, who's at a meeting? Somebody who's 20 years sober, somebody who's 20 minutes sober, and somebody who's drunk, but they're at the meeting. That's kind of what who how we are at Homeboy. Now, sometimes it it comes to a point where we have an expression here. We say, we love you. We think you're great. Come back when you're ready. Because people will demonstrate that they're not quite ready yet to dive in. And in fact, the gang members who run this place we're all kind of, it took them three or four tries. They'd come in and then they'd, you know, relapse or they'd come in and then they'd get arrested again. They had kind of one foot in and one foot out. It's a testament to this kind of the growth of this place was that in the early days, we always would fret when that happened. We don't anymore because we used to say, well, maybe they'll be back. And now we say, they'll be back. (laughs) And there's a kind of an utter confidence knowing that every single person will come back here because once you've had a dose of tenderness, it's just simply the most compelling thing there is. But our place is always packed as it is right now. I look out there every two minutes because there's a note on my door that says on a Zoom. And so everybody's watching. Yeah, I'm so thankful to them for allowing us to have this moment with you and um, take it away from them. But we are certainly getting a dose of much more than a dose of tenderness, Father. So this is this is this is super. It's really great. I suppose that very act of them coming in and saying, "I want to, I want to take this journey," is proof of that purity that lies within them. Yeah, I think so. I think so. You know, I think people are are always trying to, um, you know, they, they all want their their moms to be proud of them and their kids not to be ashamed. And that's just how human beings are. Like mental illness, for example, because that's a specific thing where you can, you know, I'm looking out at the crowd here and I see a homegirl named Jessica who who is, you know, bipolar and right now she's doing well and she's uh, taking her meds and she's not using meth, and so she's good, and and we've brought her back to work here. But, you know, she's gone off on these rages where she's kicked in our front door and shattered the glass and lots of things. But that malady was something she never chose. It chose her, and she never woke up one morning and, and said, I think I will be saddled with this mental anguish it chose her and then you can say that about everything about the complex trauma that everybody in that reception area has suffered they didn't choose any of it 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 chose them and and it's why it, i have so much admiration for them and because they are capable of such nobility and tenderness and affection always and i and i look at them and i go how are they able to pull that gracious thing off it's just kind of a remarkable thing so i i've never once looked at them and felt that they were in any way deficient i i've always felt quite the opposite i always thought wow you know the day will never come when i have more courage or i am more 
uh, noble or I'm closer to God than all the people who are filling those chairs out there. I think that's true. I don't think that's some romantic notion I have. That's born of 40 years of really knowing these folks and being privileged to know them. This last reflection from you is so consistent with something that I'm very moved by in studying individuals from history who have offered something really beautiful and noble and long-lasting to the world in some transformative capacity. And that is that the very people that they were supposedly serving they were not just loving those people. They were in love with those people. Uh, they actually adorned those people. They looked up at those people. They, You take somebody like uh, Mother Teresa and how this pastor once went to meet her and, and she receives him outside the Missions of Charity in Calcutta. And the story goes that she you know, takes his hand and said, Father, would you like to see Jesus? And he says, yes, Mother. And he thinks she's going to you know, take him to her prayer room and perhaps show him the cross or something. And and instead, she walks with him outside the missionaries of charity. And a couple of blocks down, they, they encounter this diseased and sick and old man, and, and uh, which she had heard about and had learned that he, you know, he needed help. And so she was going to bring him back to, back to her, her missionaries. And so she said, she said, Father, look at his eyes. You know, there's Jesus. There's Jesus. And come help me carry the body of Jesus back to the missionaries. This capacity to be in love and to see goodness and greatness and divinity in the very people that otherwise you're being called to serve. You know, I, I see that so much in what you've just said in, in your own path, and that's, that's so, so beautiful, so powerful. That is so beautiful. Thank you for that. Because part of the thing, what always kind of is challenging, I, I suppose, for people who are in ministry or who are at the margins or however you want to say it, is that you just simply don't go to the margins to make a difference. You go to the margins so that the folks at the margins make you different. And that feels um, backwards, but, it, but it's in fact how it's supposed to work. So I, I remember I was in Houston and I had a, a young man who was a gang member who was working with gang members now. He kind of pleaded with me very earnestly and he said, uh, how do you reach them, meaning gang members? And I found myself saying to him, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? Can you allow your heart to be altered? Because that's eternally replenishing, you know, to go to the margins and, and be affected, to go to the margins and delight in the people you encounter, to go to the margins and allow your heart to be altered. And that kind of, I think, willingness you know, is eternally replenishing. But the problem comes when, you know, the work is so hard and I guess I'm I'm just too compassionate. Those are things I always hear. And they're surprised that it's suddenly become depleting. And and that's because people allow it to become about them. And it can't be. But that's where the joy is. Uh, you know, beyond self-absorption and self-assertion, is the beginnings of being other-centered that eventually leads to being loving-centered. So cherishing people is not hard, but remembering to cherish is really difficult. And that's the kind of, you know, the practice is constant. You know, so here, because there are also a lot of gang members who are in recovery from drugs and alcohol, you know, they'll say one day at a time. And I always say, no, that's way too long. You can't wait to one day at a time. It has to be one breath at a time. You choose to cherish with every breath you take. That's why we have a practice, is so that you can cherish all the time. Hard to do. The, this podcast is called Intersections, and, and part of my aspiration here is to help us make connections and to dissolve boundaries and to see see life and the world and the universe in a much more unified way than sometimes we do when we partition things. And so there could be, you know, potentially some of our listeners who are not necessarily drawn to pastoral life and or to the form of service on the margins, you know, that you are, you know, doing such an outshining sort of work at. But I, I just want to make sure that I can connect the dots for them. So I'm going to make a fairly surprising connection, but let's see if it works. And that is in what you just shared, you know, a couple of minutes ago and Steve Jobs. What you've shared is that it's not that you go and 
change them and transform them, but you open yourself up to being transformed by them. And that reminds me of this moment close to his passing when the chief designer at Apple, Jonathan Ives, he shares the story about how he, he went up to Steve and and he, he asked him at that point, you know, was it worth it? Was it worth it? All your life and all what you've done, what you aspired for and what you did. And, and he said, like, Jobs' way of figuring out if it was worth it had not to do with how successful he became or how successful Apple became. It had to do with, you know, he had pursued his life with a certain sort of faith in humanity, a certain expectation and ask and intrigue about humanity. And it didn't happen necessarily the first day or the second day, but over the course of his life, humanity proved him right, that, that they did have that capacity in them to appreciate, appreciate things like design, appreciate things like good taste, you know, more than we give them credit for. Because at that point, there was a, you know, a lot of expectation from different technology companies and all that, that all people needed was low price and tons of features and all that. And Steve had this view that, no, people were very elegant in their design aesthetics and all of that. And he went on a very different path. And then the success of the company was a proof to him that humanity was that. So it actually warmed his heart. <laughs> it made him feel feel more whole from within. And so actually, you know, humanity had changed him, you know, in that regard. I see that potential in what you're saying to be applicable to any or all of us. Because as Bob Dylan said, you know, like you got to serve somebody, you know. So if you've got to serve somebody, whoever you're serving, you know, as a doctor, or as a lawyer, or as a government official or a teacher or a business person, do you in those moments just feel like you're kind of like doing them something, you know, through serving them? Or do you allow yourself to be in some ways changed and served and transformed by them? I think that potential is there for all of us in any profession. There's the tyranny of success, you know, which is kind of has, is always kind of beating us down. Mother Teresa also used to say that we're not called to be successful, we're called to be faithful. And so you try to find the larger love to which, to which will you, you know, what is the thing that you are going to give your heart to? And so that's kind of an essential thing because it begins by the other, as you quoted Bob Dylan. You know, part, part of the thing is the source of our sadness is self-absorption. It's not that people are selfish. It's just that they're self-absorbed. And they don't, they don't mean to do it, or it's not an in, intentionality. It's, it's kind of our default setting is, I'm worried about me. Will there be enough for me? Because I fly a lot. It's, it's like, will there be room for my overhead, in the overhead compartment for my bag? You know, it's, it's all about me. And of course, the antidote to that sadness is to, again, this is why we practice is to say, well, how can I be focused on the other? And all of a sudden you're being propelled out of your absorption. The source of all our sadness is self-absorption. An exacerbation of that sadness is self-assertion, where you're trying to kind of not just worry about, will there be enough for me? But you're trying to assert yourself into situations and into life which is the kind of the opposite of humility. The antidote is kind of right there, which is to, the minute you can kind of say, well, I'm going to, because of my practice, I'm going to begin by being other-centered. It doesn't even have to be service-centered. It's just, I'm, I'm going to take this worry that I have directed towards me, and I'm going to direct it to another person. That's a start. Where it ends up is really being loving-centered. And then you love being loving. And then nothing can stop you. But would that any of these things were a once-and-for-all decision? My God, can you imagine? But they aren't. They're, they're a constant. You have to decide it with every breath you take. And because of that, the old Zen masters would, you know, name the three things that that are important in the teachings and they would say you know attention attention and then attention and so how do you pay attention to the person in front of you and how do you delight in the spirit that delights in your being 
and how do you delight in the person who's in front of you. But it's a tricky, challenging thing because you can slip into, I will fix this person, or I, I even will help this person, that the key is to just love this person. I was blessed to be at um, Mother Teresa's canonization in Rome. Uh, there's a dear friend of mine who uh, was very close to her, so my family and I got the blessing of being invited by her you know, to that epic moment. And... Um, you know, I, I was very curious about Pope Francis. I was looking, observing him from a distance because he, he wasn't necessarily right next to me, but, you know, you could see him. There was this moment where there were a number of parishioners, probably from around the world, you know, in their, in their black garb, and uh, they were, you know, going to get an audience with him. And so he was, he was standing there receiving them, you know, one after the other, holding their hand, you know, speaking with, with them and then bidding them farewell in some ways. And then the next one would come and the next one. And they were all kind of almost like in, in, in a line, you know. And um, I just kept observing him because I was curious. I was curious if his attention would waver, if for any moment he might sort of look beyond them to just see the vastness of the crowd or the grandeur of that, you know, square and any of that or the sky or something or the other. But it was remarkable. You know, I, every time I observed him, for as long as I observed him, his attention never wavered. It was just on that person right in front of him. And uh, then the next person, next person. And later on, it struck me that whereas for him, it may have been kind of like a forgivable act, you know, if for a few seconds his attention had wavered, or for one of those individuals, he wasn't fully there, for that individual, you know, who had flown probably from some distant part of the world, and this might be perhaps the only audience they would get with, with the Pope. It must be so devastating if they didn't get like his whole self in that moment. And on the other hand, it must be so uplifting and affirming to get his whole self. It was really quite inspiring to see that. I have a picture right here of me with the Pope. That was absolutely my experience. And, and you just think it it's utterly remarkable for that brief time that you're shaking his hand and your eyes are connecting and then you have this very odd feeling like he thinks you're the only person who exists and it's just kind of it's remarkable and and i wish i could do it i wish i could be as attentive to that but that again that must be part of his practice too and it was like 200 jesuits and co-workers and we were all at a conference kind of a justice conference for about five days. And then one day they just said, hey, you know, we're all going over to the Vatican. So we just, 200 of us marched over there. And and then, he, you know, he spoke to us. And then one by one, and, and that was, it's fascinating that you would say that you would focus on and see if he would waver. And I, I can just tell you, boy, he just doesn't waver. And then, you know, after you get a certain age, you start thinking, I don't know, he, he he's kind of remarkable that way. But there's a lesson in that, which is uh, all people are longing for is attention. And the minute you kind of direct it to them, it's it's so powerful. Just this morning, I was meeting with um, Rob Garris, uh, dear friend. He uh, works with another dear friend, uh, Father Phil Jackson here at Trinity Church. And... Uh, you know, I was recounting for him a quote from Rumi, you know, who you cited as well, where he says, um, you are not a drop in the ocean, you are the whole ocean in a drop. You know that, right, Father? It seems to me like folks like you, like the Pope, have really cultivated that craft of seeing everybody as the whole ocean. So it might look like it's only one person in front of you, but you're playing the game the right way. It's like you, you see the whole universe in that person. And, I, and I'd love to get there. And so for now, I'm, I'm just theorizing this as much, you know, you know, as opposed to kind of completely being able to live it in my own life. I, I want to do more of that. But um, yeah, yeah. Thank you for inspiring us. You know, that. And I think part of the, the, the problem is that we think that any of these decisions or commitments, you know, really is one and done, like it, that it's once and for all. But I think that it's very freeing to know that, no, this is a constant deciding and you're always choosing to be, you know, attentive. I don't know, that, that feels kind of uh, 
liberating a little bit to know right. that you get to choose this all over again with every yeah. moment. And and because you're human beings and you're again, it's like not that people are bad, they're distracted. Not that people are selfish, they're just self absorbed. They're worried about what happens next. You know, the the more that we can be anchored in the present moment, you know, with the person and we're all kind of saved in the present moment anyway. You want to be there when it happens. I'll make another connecting of dots. One of the individuals uh, who's been a really valued mentor I've learned so much from is um, Dr. David Burns. You know, he's at Stanford University. He's a preeminent exponent of the uh, therapy uh, field of cognitive behavior therapy, CBT. Has made pioneering contributions in that and wrote this book called Feeling Good, you know, the new mood therapy has gone around, taught, taught a lot of therapists uh, this discipline. Anyway, so he, he, one thing I learned from him is this notion of, you know, how can we see our mental uh, life more as state, not trait? And I, I think that connects very well with what I, I hear you saying, that it's very liberating when you realize you're not trying to become something that you're not, but you may just have drifted away from a certain, you know, core state, you know, which if you can get back to, then you already have attention, you already have compassion, you already have purity, you know, in, in that state. You just need to moment by moment practice that discipline. And that's why it's more about inhabiting rather than gaining, not about achievement. Like with the homies here, you say, you are the achievement. It's not outside of you. And, you know, we always have kind of moments where we celebrate graduations and that kind of thing. And we always say that to them. You know, we say, you are the achievement. And the more they can inhabit that truth, the more they become and become more fully that truth. Otherwise, it's it's kind of aspirational. They're wanting to become something that's outside themselves. And yeah, there are accomplishments, but but you are the achievement. I'm going to quote from you. You say, tenderness is the methodology. It's the only way that your love can no longer stay in your heart or your head or the ether. It becomes connective, connective tissue. In the way you have formed this community and in the way, you know, these, uh, you know, former gang members have come together and gained something so powerful about their own discovery of the true self. Could there be like a practice that you can point to um, certain kind of behavior or norm or, you know, some ritual or something that you have found to be really, yeah, reliable. It works. It, it really helps them when they regularize that and when you can spread that across the, across the community uh, that others can learn from as they're seeking to build perhaps some of the right culture, you know, in their family, um, in, in their organization, in their school. Yeah, you know, part of the thing is, I, I'm kind of a mantra person, so I, I'm I'm always yeah. kind of trying to stay in the present moment. You know, like a, there's a an expression I I will use, you know, in my head. Now hear this, which is the thing that was that's kind of announced on a loudspeaker, like on a battleship. Now hear this, and then they give a message. But it's it, for me, it's about now because there is nothing other, no other time and it's here not not here but here and it's this moment this person so i'm trying to kind of in a mantra way trying to get to a place where i can say now here this this is the moment here is the time this is the person for example you know saint ignatius of loyola has has a as a word that he used in his spiritual journal he first used it, you know, 12 years before he died. And the word is acatamiento, acatamiento. And it comes from a, an archaic Spanish word that doesn't get used very much called acatar, which means to look at something with attention. And in English, it gets translated as affectionate awe. And there's no doubt that this was born of some mystical moment with with the god of ignatius's understanding but he really didn't want it to to remain just a private mystical moment 
He wanted it to be a stance in the world. And so the stance is acatamiento. It's affectionate awe. For me, it's, it's um, I don't know how good a translation that is of that concept, but it's the merging of cariño, affection, and a kind of an admiration for what the poor have to carry. And so that be, has become for me kind of a, a longing. And, and because its derivation is from a word that means to look at something with attention, it's connected to all the kind of the traditions that say, you know, pay attention. You know, Mary Oliver, who's an American poet who um, died at 84, I think. And just before she died, she, she kind of came to this conclusion. These are the three things I've learned in 84 years. One, pay attention. Two, be astonished. And three, share your astonishment. And I think that's pretty much it. You know, you want to be in awe of people because everybody is carrying something extraordinarily heavy. And you want to be astonished at how noble people are and at the courage of their own tenderness. And you want to share your astonishment, which is, you know, really basically wanting to announce a message, you know. What if we were to be in exquisite mutual, mutual kinship with each other? rather than endlessly striking a high moral distance that keeps us apart. My experience, like traveling the country and giving talks, is that there is such a longing for all our talk of division. There's such a longing for people, you know, that to what ought we to give our hearts? And, and, and that's kind of the question. And people want to give their hearts, but they're kind of, they don't know how to do it or where, you know, what, what direction. But once they find that it's, it's kind of outside themselves and it's an extent of love, as I, you know, as the God who loves us without measure and without regret, you know, that you want to live in that place. I wrote a newsletter um, some time back and, uh, you know, there were a lot of people who found it very, um, affirming and hope inducing and all of that and then there were a few who were not happy <laughs> with it uh, you know so about three or so voices came back to me saying like but listen you you didn't really acknowledge this or you know you should have really also addressed this or you know what have you and and um my critics and um so i i, I did this experiment of just kind of writing back to them from a place of like thank you and you know i'm i'm grateful that you've been so honest and open and i imagine if there are three of you there might be another 30 who haven't really even shared their uh concern but uh through you i'm getting to hear that like there were a few things which were left incomplete you know, in my in my conversation with you and what would your advice be you know here is what you and i we both aspire for in life and so what would your advice be to me with you know with the events and the situation and what i'm trying to offer you and so it was beautiful. I mean, each of them wrote back to me. And each of them was in a place of such affirmation and warmth and, you know, encouragement and, and openness. And I even uh, happened to be able to meet up with one of them because they were in New York, this individual. Uh, and we had a beautiful connection there as well. And it, it just made me realize how much there are these forks in the road, you know, when certain things happen. And if you are quick to judge or conclude that there's obviously no meeting of minds here or hearts, you know, then then you withdraw and then you protect and then you defend and then, you know, and then it goes from, you know, from a small little sort of spark to something much bigger, you know, or, or a thick wall, you know, that gets formed between various groups of people. But then just small acts of reaching across and forming a bridge or opening up and wanting to tune in could, can just lead to a whole different response and a whole different outcome and reality for the world. So that was a big lesson. You know, Pema Chodron would talk about you catch yourself because the temptation is to be defensive in the face of critics and defensive, even though there are three people who voiced some contrary opinion. 
you you had 300 others who who loved what you wrote but then it's kind of like we're like that you know we kind of go we're drawn to defend ourselves and that's part of our practice too is where you can catch yourself you know here homies will kind of sometimes go to a place of great violence and then the homies who run the place you know will say to them you were taken to that place and and you let yourself be taken to that place and it's not supposed to make them feel badly or guilty about it but it's a kind of a you know everybody wants to be sturdier and and they want a a, a hope that's more muscular that can kind of keep you from being taken to that place and then it's a sense of agency and power that people are. There was a homie who wanted to see me, but he was afraid to come here because uh, he had gotten in a fight, you know. And uh, I said, "You're okay. You're the boss. You get to decide whether somebody takes you to that place or not." So he he came, you know, and he was nervous, but it was like you know, it gave me an opportunity to to congratulate him for for his courage and his bravery in walking into a place where he felt, even though he had been the instigator of the fight, but, you know, he, he would also, you know, he kind of came to terms a little bit with what he had done. And it was just beautiful to observe. And then, you know, to be caught up in the no matter whatness, that it, it just won't matter. And, and you'd be happier if you didn't get in fights. It's not about behavior. We're not trying to cultivate here a behaving community, but a community of cherished belonging. That's way different. My um, spiritual teacher, Yogananda, I don't know if you know, know of him. He's got you know, quite a presence in the Los Angeles area. He's you know, a hundred-year-old organization, a self-realization fellowship. Anyway, there's, there's a quote from him which um, speaks, speaks to what you were just saying. He said, when the I shall die, then shall I know who am I. There's another very beautiful quote that you, you've shared once from Teilhard de Chardin. And, and I want to share this because of, you know, the fact that the path you're on is not an easy path. You know, this path of helping people get to their true self might at times take, as you've said, many iterations. You know, you have to open yourself up to relapses from time to time, you know, as opposed to like the instant kind of gratification that one may sometimes be pulled to want, you know, out of a certain show of strength or power or, you know, whatever. And so this quote from him that you talk about is that we must trust in the slow work of God. Because people, you know, it, being patient with the process and, and the slow work, you know, is really essential. I've been doing this for 40 years. And in the early years, you know, the first 10 years was really marked by death threats, bomb threats, and hate mail, and never directed towards me from gang members, but from people who demonize gang members. Gang members always knew this was about hope for them. But but if you demonize gang members, it's a short hop to demonize me for helping them. So that it's hard to retrieve now because it's really quite old, but it was part of the air we breathed. It was really a daily thing and intense, in fact. and But now, you know, Homeboy Industries is, has been sort of hoisted up on the shoulders of the city of Los Angeles, you know, where they, you know, they kind of get it, and they know that, yeah, this is, this is better than tough on crime. It's smart on crime. Those kinds of notions. It took 40 years. Once you're committed to the slow work of God in that sense, you know, you, you have a light grasp on on the timing of it all. And so I can look back and I can say, wow, you know, policing is different than it was when I started. And all sorts of things are different than when I started. But if you want this to be fast and over, you're not that suited for this kind of effort, you know, because it's a long haul kind of effort. You don't live in that reality, you don't, because we're not interested in working with the most likely to succeed here. All we want to do is love the people who walk through the door. And then you're not worried about success. 
you're not worried about evidence-based outcomes, which is what funders all ask about. But you just kind of say, I don't know. I'm just going to, we're going to love being loving here. And that has to be enough for us. Well, I'm so glad you're writing this book because, um, again, you as a small community in one part of the world, you know, you're, you're not a drop. You're the whole ocean. And in the work you do, you have uncovered and validated certain enduring truths, you know, that can be embraced and applied by any and all of us in our own travails and trials and, yeah, you know, trails in life. And so I'm, I'm super grateful that there will be an opportunity for us to hear from you through that frame, you know, through that larger frame. If I can piece it together, because it's, uh, it's, you know, it's not quite there yet, but, uh, you know, I've written 135 pages of, I think I like, and what kind of makes sense for me. The departure point is is this community here where people cherish and feel cherished. And and I think there's a maybe a, a key that can unlock some door. Father, what's your big dream for the future beyond this book, in your work, in your path? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of don't really get very future. You know, sometimes people force me to be future oriented and so we're we're trying to kind of expand our campus, but that that's kind of tinier than I'm interested in. There's a whole what we'd like to do is really conceive of some alternative to incarceration. You know, if the largest mental institution in the world is Los Angeles County Jail, well then maybe we could do something differently in terms of drugs and mental illness and job training. You know, we're, we're doing it but what if we really imagined the day when policing was obsolete and prisons were, in fact, empty? That's a larger love that intrigues me. We're kind of starting to design what we call Hope Village as a real alternative to incarceration and try it as an experiment in the same way that we're looking always to other countries about you know, Finland or wherever, where they do prisons in a different, more humane way. You know, our our goal wouldn't be, you know, how do we make prisons nicer, but how do we make communities healthier? That's galvanizing a lot of my kind of interest and passion at the moment. You know, I don't really run this place anymore. 70% of our senior staff are all gang members who have come through the program which is huge. And so now their ownership is so total that I'm just kind of uh, the janitor now, happy to be. That kind of, uh, you know, galvanizes my imagination to think about what if what if we set up a model where people, cities could say, what if we did this differently rather than futilely trying to incarcerate our way out of all our problems? And the, the basic choice is, what if we decided not to punish wound anymore, but to heal it? Incredible. How powerful and um, inspiring vision and may take a while to fully play out and become practical and, you know, scaled in America and the world beyond. But um, why not start with a vision of a more utopian possibility and work our ways in inches towards it, even though God's work is slow, right? Uh, that That's a you know, I cheer you on in what you're doing. If there are those amongst our listeners who want to be of some support in some service and our moods, you know, about the the work you're doing, um, Father, is there is there a practical way for them to be in touch? Anything you want to share here for uh, for our listeners? Well, you know, I hope people when they're in Los Angeles come to Chinatown. That's where our headquarters is, and it's it's uh, and go to the front front desk and ask for a tour, and one of the homies or homegirls will walk you through the place. Right. And it's kind of you know, people are, are always very moved by it. Plus, we have Homegirl Cafe, and then we have people can order merchandise and food online. And so that's that helps uh, pay our bills and, and keep people working. So, But our website is homeboyindustries.org, so they can find all the information they need there. Thank you, Father. Yeah, I'm wishing you and 
everyone at Homeboy is just, um, you know, just a blessed path for all the beautiful work you're doing, which I know has impact and ramifications for the whole world, not just, you know, not just for what is a very special community that you've created there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stay well. Yeah, you too. You too.